here in this day of worship um, during this pandemic. I know it's difficult. Please bring our hearts together as one in praise of you, Lord, for you are good and you are gracious. And in Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, praise team. Thank you, everyone, for being here in person. And those of you who are joining us online, we welcome you as well. I can't believe but amazing April has gone by and today is already the first week of May. And so when a month ends and a month begins, you know, I start having many thoughts of, wow, you know, God, what do you want me to share next? And so um, this month, you know, as the world opens up and more people are gathering, um, I realize that there are some areas that we really just need to refine and review and really get back to the heart of worship. And uh, there was a book I was reading and I didn't really know this, but there was a book that I was reading about paradoxical commandments and it was written by this person called Kent Keith and I read one of his books when I was in grad school so that was like about 10 years 10 years ago or maybe 20 years ago well anyway it was a long time ago but I didn't realize that at that time when I read it it was the title was Jesus did it anyways um, I didn't know that this author was from Hawaii. So this author, Kent Keith, if you ever get a chance to read one of his books, please read it. He graduated from Roosevelt High School. So some of you guys are attending Roosevelt High School. He held a high position in one of the city council um, offices. 
But he actually gives all of that up at one point in his life because he really wanted to dive deeper into this lifestyle of paradoxical commandments. And so paradoxes are like basically statements that seems really, really absurd. It seems like it doesn't make sense. It actually contradicts each other within that phrase. But with enough uh, investigation and explanation, it actually comes out or proves to be true. And so this author, Kent Keith, actually goes and, and wrote this book based on the paradox that Jesus taught. And some of the paradoxes that he thought was things like everything that we know, you know, Jesus is one of the paradox was whoever wants to be become great, among you must be a servant, right? That doesn't really make sense. It seems like it's a contradiction. If you want to be great, you need to serve. Those who want to be first must be your servant, right? It doesn't make sense. But in his teaching with a lot of explanation and diving deep into it, it does make sense. Another one that Jesus says is whoever finds his life will lose it and whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. And so I was, as I was reading this book, I thought, oh, wow, I want to share some of this paradoxical thoughts because when you first hear it, it's like a contradiction and it doesn't make sense. Like, why would I want to be first? And, and in order for me to be first, I need to be last. That doesn't make any sense. But things that doesn't make any sense, we ha usually have two responses. You actually want to investigate to see why someone or something said that. Or some of us may be like, ah, it doesn't make sense, and you just forget about it. But this month, I want us to go through some paradoxical statements and not be like, yeah, it doesn't make sense, and forget about it. But I want us to dive deeper and um, hopefully by the end, you know, agree with whatever the statement it is that uh, we kind of cover. And then so I thought, well, you know what? I want to do some paradoxical like statements or commandments that maybe maybe Jesus did. And then I thought, you know, we've been covering so much, you know, we've been covering Paul's letters and so many things. And I thought, why don't, why don't I just come up with paradoxical thoughts and come, not, not commandments, but just thoughts and statements, something that's relevant to our lives. Hopefully something that when I say you'll be like, yeah, I, I agree. Or yeah, that's, that's a paradox. That's very ironic contradiction. And hopefully you would agree with me um, in saying, but. Anyways, we still have to do that. So this month, we're going to be doing do it anyways. And I added with a smile. Do it anyways with a smile. And there's going to be a lot of four or five paradoxical uh, statements that we're going to dive deeper. And the reason why I added with a smile is because your brain and your body actually cannot differentiate a real laughter, a real smile, or a fake laughter, or a fake smile. And that's science proven. And so when I was looking up stuff on laughter and smile, and recently in a training I attended, I didn't know, but did you guys know there is something called a laughter yoga? So if you think like, what are you talking about, Mr. Jen? You look it up, you Google it, and there's actually a TED Talk video on laughter yoga. And so I was close to showing you the video. And then I thought, oh, my God, you guys are going to think I'm insane. And then I thought, oh, why don't we do some laughter yoga? And then I thought, yeah, you guys are going to probably either turn me off or you. I think you would laugh. And that's OK, because the whole TED Talk was about, you know, laughing, whether you really mean it or you're forcing yourself to laugh. It's fine because your body actually releases healthy um, hormones without knowing if it's true or fake. And that's the reason why I added in our paradoxical statements that we will cover in May, do it anyways with a smile. Because I want you to not only do things that God has commanded of us, but do it with a smile. And I kid you not, sometimes it's hard. Sometimes it's hard to do it with a smile, but I want you to do it anyways with a smile. You see that paradox? It's a contradiction, but hopefully in the month of May, we will be able to prove through our number one primary source, which is the Bible. So the first paradoxical statement that I want to share with you, and I hope you would be like, yeah, find some relevance, is this. And it says what? The Bible may be boring, but meditate on it anyways with a smile. That is our first paradoxical statement, 
statement that I want to dive deeper today. And instead of having one Bible verse, we're going to just go on a journey through many different Bible verses um, because I think, you know, usually when I speak in the last, I think maybe last couple of months, we were either diving deeper into the book of James or in the letters of Paul or on a certain concept. And so this month, I just want us to just kind of freely roam around the Bible and see what it says so that we can validate and verify that it's not only the letters of Paul. It wasn't only in the New Testament. It was in the old, it was in the new, that reading the Bible, even though we think it's boring at times, is so, so important that we need to do it anyways and with a smile. So the first verse that I want to share with you, and you guys um, don't have to stand, is uh, let's read it together though. Okay, it comes from the book of John, chapter 1, verses 14. Let's read it together. Ready? Begin. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father full of grace and truth. Let me ask you a general question. How many of you want to see Jesus and hear Jesus every day? Honestly, how many of you guys want to see and hear Jesus every day? But it seems like we can't or we don't because he seems so far away. Or if you really, really, truly, truly want to Jesus, but you don't know how. Well, the answer is very simple from the scripture that we read. And it says what? The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. If you want to see Jesus, if you want to hear his voice and talk with him, the primary source that you can actually go to that's easily accessible, number one best-selling book in the world, right, is to go and meditate on the Bible. And I know this is a common answer, but a common answer that we overlook. Last week, I talked to both groups, and I said, you know what, if you want to gain more, you need to give more. And part of it is preparing your hearts for worship through the giving of offering. Not money, not dollar bill crumpled up coming out of your wallet, but giving your heart. And again, today you have two envelopes on your chair, one for today and one to prepare for next week. Eventually this will fade away, but I want us to refine, review, reinforce, and just re-emphasize what the importance of is when we prepare our hearts for worship and in it is offering. Because that's one of the paradoxical kind of statements that God says, you know what, you give me just a tenth. I'm not even asking for the hundredth percent, which I deserve, but I want you to show me through your heart just 10% of your tithe. Show me through your heart whatever you want to do for missions, for my kingdom, for my church, for my people, and I will give you more. So if we want to see Jesus, we need to meditate on the word of God, even though it may seem boring. And we need to do it anyways and with a smile. There are so many verses about scriptures in the Bible, but today I'm going to actually just cover three just to kind of uh, make a point and hopefully you to agree. Yeah, you know what? To be honest, yeah, the Bible is boring, but you're correct. Through our diving in and researching and kind of looking at the explanation, yeah, we need to do it anyways and hopefully with a smile. The word became flesh, which means Jesus was the word and the word is Jesus. Therefore, when we read the Bible and we look at it as a simple book, reading that black and white typed out words on a page or a piece of paper or on your tablet or or on your phone, they're just going to be words that's meaningless. But if you're looking at the black and white typed out words on a page or a tablet or a phone or a computer, whatever, thinking that is life, that is Jesus, and through that word, you are going to receive guidance. Through that word, you're going to receive healing and comfort. And through that word, you're going to receive the teaching that what must we do next? So what now? And it is through the word that we will continue our path in Jesus. But to be honest, sometimes it is boring. Like some of the the genealogy, you, you just read it and you're like, what? But you know what? If you really, really dive deeper into the Bible, you would be surprised that even something boring like the genealogy 
actually has secrets and deeper meaning. A couple weeks ago, uh, we read Hosea, and the teachers and I, we kind of like, we were meeting to share our insights, and we're like, what are we going to share? And if you have no idea what I'm talking about, you either read the book of Hosea or you come and talk to me because the book of Hosea was a shocking book. Like, what are, why I'm not like that? And so sometimes it's shocking and you think you have no relevance. But yet, when we read it, anyways, with a smile, it deepens our understanding of who Jesus is. Sometimes I feel bad for God. And, you know, as I dive deeper and deeper into the word, I feel like, oh, sorry, God. Like, it's like we misunderstood you. You know, God says he has plans for us to, to make us prosperous. He knew us by name. But nowhere in the Bible he promises us that you will get accepted to Ivy League. Nowhere in the Bible it says when you accept me as your Savior, your life is no, no problem. Nowhere in the Bible it says if you accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior that you will never sin and you will be an angel. No. But sometimes we read the Bible and we make assumptions and we contextualize with our life and we think that's the truth. The danger and the problem to that is, is because we have not really, really meditated on it. I don't want you to read the Bible. Sometimes we do want to read it to get a basic gist basic summary. That's fine. But the meditation that I'm talking about is doing your devotionals to meditate on the word, to really, really have the word change you. Not you change the word or you think that's what it means, but really having the word capture your heart and your lives to be changed and renewed, to be like Jesus. So what now? The Bible can be boring at times, but meditate on it anyways with a smile. Jesus is the word, and Jesus is always there if you want to see him or hear him. Second, why? Why do we, knowing that the Bible can be boring at times, why do we have to meditate on it? That doesn't make any sense. That's a contradiction in itself. The second reason comes from the book of Psalms. It says Psalms chapter 119, verse 105. So Psalms 119 is like smack in the middle of the whole Bible. Um, and page-wise, it's one of the longest uh, Psalms. Um, and it says what? Let's read it together. Ready? Begin. Your word is a lamp for my feet, a light on my path. Amen. It was very, very clear uh, through the last year during the pandemic that our lives are very unstable, and at any given time, we can walk in this darkness, uh, feeling out of control, feeling there's nothing I can do to fight this microscopic virus that I can't even see. It was very dark. It was very hope, like very, very uh, hopeless, kind of. And people were just like, what's happening? But yet, for us, there was light. There was hope. Because Jesus clearly says that, you know, we are not to be afraid and shocked at what goes on in the world. Because he will be with us till the end of time. And that is a promise. No matter what we think of the Bible, the truth is that it is our source of life because he is the word. He is not only the word, but he is also the light in our lives. In the Old Testament during that time, when it says the lamp for my feet, basically it means that, you know, whenever there's darkness, these people had to carry on a lamp with oil. So they needed to be really, really prepared because if they go out far away and they didn't prepare enough oil, they will be in complete darkness. And that's something they can't control. Um, they always had to put the oil before they went out and be prepared. I mean, now we have electricity, so we don't understand this, this complete darkness. I mean, if you can experiment, please do like complete darkness, not even a little, little like light from like your router or a little light from like your alarm clock, you know, nothing, complete darkness to the point that you put your hand in front of you and you can't even see your hand, complete darkness. And once you're in your complete darkness, it's kind of scary because you, you can't, you're kind of frozen. You can't take a step because you have no idea what's happening. 
And so the psalmist is saying in Psalms 119 that the Lord is the lamp to my path and my feet. Because in life, we actually don't know what's going to happen right in front of us. We actually don't know what's right behind us, what's right to the side, without the light of God. We may not know the answer to our lives, to be honest. And sometimes our questions may not be answered. But, you know, this is another part where I feel like maybe we misunderstood God. Perhaps we don't have to know all the answers. Perhaps that's not what's important to God, that we know the answer. Perhaps what's important to God is the fact that we believe and we continue to walk in faith that he will light up our path, that he will light up the lamp to my feet. As I was meditating on this verse, I thought, that's right. God never promised us, you know what? I'm going to give you a spotlight. I'm going to give you a spotlight so bright, so wide that you can see miles and miles away for your life that you just go on. If there's an obstacle, jump because you can see it. No. What God wants from us is knowing that sometimes it can be dark. Knowing sometimes the light can be very dim. Sometimes we have to squint our eyes. But if you've ever been in complete darkness, you know from experience that even small, small streak of light, that makes a huge difference. A couple of weeks ago when the electricity went off in our building, um, in the whole part of town, I didn't realize um, how dark it can get. So when we came home, it was complete darkness even that little light that was flickering from our cable or or our uh microwave or nothing complete darkness and when we turned on our flashlight we realized wow something that when we usually turn on it's not a big deal was a huge deal here's the light and even if the bible may seem boring at times we are to meditate on it anyways with a smile believing in that he will always light up our path. The last reason why we need to meditate on the word is in Psalms 18, uh, verse 30. Let's read it together in one voice. Ready, begin. As for God, his way is perfect. The Lord's word is flawless. He shields all who take refuge in him. This first, I have to give you a little bit of background because we have to understand the context. So during this time when David wrote this psalm or chapter or the verse, he was actually being um, chased by King Saul, who was filled with jealousy. And when I say he was being chased, it wasn't like, wow, David, I'm going to catch you and I'm going to be like yelling at you. No, David, I'm going to catch you. And when I catch you, I'm going to kill you. So he wasn't just running away because he didn't want to have a hard conversation or didn't want to get blamed. He was running away for his life. So as he's running away for his life, if you get to see the whole chapter, um, you can see how David is facing close, close times when he's faced with death. He's on the brink of dying. He is really asking God that, you know what, God, you need to be my shield. You need to be my trainer, my fortress. You need to be my rock and all these great things to protect me so that I will not be killed. And you need to do this for me so that I can prepare for this battle that I am to fight. Not necessarily a physical battle, but a spiritual battle within. Because at one point, actually not only once, I think a couple of times David actually had an opportunity to kill King Saul. But he doesn't because he truly, truly believes that the judgment is left up to God and that even though King Saul was after his life, he believed that there was a reason why God anointed King Saul to be that king. Oftentimes, even in our leaders in the world, we're like, oh, my God, I can't believe he's the king. I can't believe he's the president, prime minister, secretary of state, blah, blah, blah. But what we are to do is as we dive deeper into the word, understand it and meditate on it because we are to respect the authority that is above us, that is leading us. No matter what they're doing, where our faith stands is not in that government or in that leader in that specific situation, but our 
faith stands in the word of God, in the Lord who is flawless. And this faith that David had allowed him to be strengthened, allowed him to be in a situation where he encountered King Saul and he didn't kill him. He said, you know what? That's for God to do. And he just kept running. You know, a lot of us wants to take revenge and any, any opportunity we get or we create opportunities to seek revenge. But David said, no, that's not my job. David had faith um, that God's word is flawless. Now here at this point, we can kind of question or throw out this question. Why then do some people read the word of God and is engrossed in it, loves it, and their lives are changed? And some read the Bible, or seems like read the Bible, but they're not changed. Why is that? There's a lot of answers, and we can talk about it for a while. But it's because we have this choice that God gave us, this free will. Because he doesn't want robots, and he wants a special relationship with us, he gives us all of us this gift. And as I mentioned last week, this amazing grace that we have is something that we need to consciously choose. Similarly, when we read the word of God, we have to consciously choose. Yes, this is the word of God. Amen. I believe you and I will, I will apply it to my life. Amen. Father, you have convicted me and I will repent. Thank you, God, for teaching me and, and unveiling to me and to discern that, you know what, this path that although logically it seemed like the right path, no, it wasn't. What you want from me is obedience. What you want from me is faith. What you want from me is to just dwell in your presence, to be loved by you. And all of that, we can only be convicted, no matter how boring the Bible may be. Once we meditate on it anyways, with a smile, in full anticipation and excitement. Like, God, what do you have treasured for me today? What can I meditate on over and over and devote my life so that I may live here on earth but enjoy the heavenly realm? It has nothing to do with me but everything to do with Jesus. How can we confess that? And I realized some change through the word because they believe Jesus Christ as their personal savior. I believe that they are forgiven and will resurrect one day and, and have access to heaven. And therefore, they continue to meditate on the word of God, to obey, to follow. Kind of hard to follow direction if you don't know what the directions are. And some not fully believe in the death or resurrection of Christ and just wander. They know it's good stuff, but they don't want to commit. And you know, it's not these two groups of people are not only outside in the world, but it could be inside in our church. And that is the reason why the teachers and I, we serve and we work to our best to make sure that all of you not only have accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, but will meditate on the word day and night so that you understand that the word is Jesus. That you understand no matter how dim that light is, there is light. And Jesus promises that light will be with you until he calls you. And that light, the word, is flawless. And he requires of us the faith like King David. No matter what the situation is, the only thing that we must hold on to for dear life, for dear life, is the word of God, which is what saved David to become a king. Now, we know David makes mistakes too, but his faithfulness in the word of God, belief that God will never forsake him or leave him, is what kept David a great king till this day. Let's pray. Father God, there's a lot of things that we don't forget to do. We don't forget to eat. We don't forget to do our homework. We don't forget to study for our test. We don't forget to meet our friends or text them. But Father, sometimes we easily 
forget or forego the meditation of your word. Father, no matter how boring your words may be, as the world says, help us to do it anyways with a smile because we know that when we meditate on your words, we meet you, we see you, we hear you. When we meditate on your words, you light up our, our path. Sometimes it may seem dark and bleak and hopeless, but you light it up because our hope is in you who is eternal. And your words are flawless. That no matter what the world throws at us, Father, we are not the judge. We will not seek revenge. We will no longer seek the ways of the world. But Father, help us to live according to your words. Please convict us and help us to live a life of this paradox statement. And no matter how absurd or no matter how foolish the world may think of us, Father, help us to do that with dear life and never forget it. Help us to continue to dive deeper so that we can do what it says. We love you. We give you our lives. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let's continue to worship as we collect our tithes and offering during this time. And all my life you have been faithful. And all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I offering please bless the people who've given it and please what please keep everybody safe and in his name yeah. Good morning, everyone. I just want to welcome you to our worship. Those of you guys who are joining us online, welcome as well. Today, after worship, for those of you who are in person at church, we'll be going over to the main sanctuary to record our special praise for Mother's Day. I hope you had an opportunity to listen to Jesus Loves Me um, in a jazzy version so that we can have fun while we're praising God. Also in May, we have a lot of birthdays, so more celebration. We have Rachel Kim, Ryan Lee, Andrew Cha, Justin Hong, who's in Korea, and Joshua Lee. Any chance we get to celebrate, we want to, and we just want to thank all of you to, uh, for being a part of our lives. In the month of May, these are the servants for prayer and offering. I'm letting you know in advance so that you can prepare um, for Olivia to record on Sunday. Also, as we saw in the announcements, next week, Saturday on May 8th, we'll be gathering in the Fellowship Hall for about two hours to make carnation uh, for Mother's Day. Those of you guys who can come by, please come. If you have any questions, give me a call or text. Also, if you have not joined our weekly Bible study, which will be enhancing and just diving deeper into the Word to have fellowship, um, please let me know and I'll get you connected. After worship, those of you who are in person at church, please uh, look at the announcements to follow your group. All the announcements are also being sent to you via Cop Talk so that you guys can see it on the written announcement as well. All grade 9, you'll be going with Mr. Chris and he will be in the elementary uh, worship hall. All grade 7 and 12, you'll be going with Miss Heather. She will be in the first classroom. And all grades 6 and 11, you'll be with Miss Minji in the second classroom down the hall. And all grades 8 and 10, you'll be going with Mr. Tuck, who will be in the worship, uh, the youth worship hall. Next week, it may be different, so you need to pay attention to which group you're going. Stay safe and healthy, and we will see you soon. Let's say the Lord's Prayer as we end worship. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For, For thine is the kingdom, kingdom, and the power, and the glory, glory forever. forever. Amen. Amen.